G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, and we serve property investors who, what I call, are ambitious and sometimes frustrated when it comes to scaling up their portfolio. And as part of the journey, when we're talking about some of those headwinds, uh, what we really want to do is assemble a dream team around a client. So someone that's either been there, done that, someone that has the expertise, for example, someone that serves in a particular niche. But the goal here is to help investors succeed. And sometimes it's quality over quantity, and sometimes it's you know, division, subdivisions and development opportunities as well. Today's guest uh, is a name that's synonymous with investing in, uh, in real estate and building a property portfolio, been in magazines, been in the news, uh, has a great community of um, people, has a great brand, an attraction brand inside uh, investing in property. If you haven't heard of Nathan Birch, uh, you are living under a rock, I'm assuming, when it comes to investing in property. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the nice welcome as well. No, nah, nah, I could keep going, but you know, like I said, I'm not here to stroke your ego, mate. And uh, it's in fact, uh, as as we said before, when you jumped on, it's um, I look at your background. So anyone that's looking at the video version of this will see an amazing a backdrop. That's not an illusion. That's actually real as well. So this is coming from your home it's in Dural. Right, yeah. yeah. Excellent. So it's, uh, I could have had a better view, but the sun isn't allowing for it. So I'm just. <laughs> Man, I think it's fantastic. It's like, I mean, it's, it's peaceful and serene from what I'm hearing at the moment. So I'm guessing that the experience is something else being out there as well. Exactly, exactly. I'm on almost 20 acres here and, uh, you yeah, know, try and be self-sufficient and, uh, yeah, living the lifestyle of how I want to live. And, Unreal, yeah, mate. Life, uh, congratulations. And, I mean, let's let's talk about that for a second because we are talking about property. Is this a, is this the realisation of a dream that we come to – to buy, uh, to be in a place like this, and and call home. Yeah, when I first started buying properties uh, back in two thousand and three, that's when I bought my first property in Western Sydney. Yeah, um, I was looking around at you know everything that I could have bought, and my income. But you're a broker, you understand you know, when you go and type in a loan what some of the serviceability <laughs> yeah. is. As a a forty five fifty grand a year income in 2003 with an interest rate of seven eight percent yeah nine percent at the time um the it's a, it's a very limited sort of market of what i could have bought okay. in sydney and i could have bought a red brick three-bedroom house to live in but it wouldn't have been the dream house and it would have been severely disadvantaged by being stuck to that mortgage so i went down the road of not even rent vesting because i was living at home i had the, the benefit of living at home yeah. and not having to you know pay a mortgage and that at the time and i thought if i just had a simple strategy that could you know replace my income then i could have that income then pay for the lifestyle things that i wanted so i just set out to build an income stream i thought it was impossible at the time and then i just hustled and did whatever it takes to get there and you know now it's the delayed gratification there has been a lot of delayed gratification there mm. along the way and i guess people see this and you, you talk about buying your first property in 2003 i mean we do the math on that with what are we talking? 20, 18, yeah, 20, nearly 20 years, right? It's a overnight success, 20 years in the making. So congratulations. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm constantly hustling, you know, like people say, oh, Virgie, why don't you, you know, you seem down to earth for someone that's done whatever you've done. Uh, and I'm like, I'm just always, I'm, I make myself feel like I'm starting at square one at all points, mm. right? Like I'm always trying to hustle, always trying to redefine and push myself to that next level. And um, being, vulnerable to, to learning being vulnerable to growth being you know a, ability to move through different market cycles that's enabled me to continuously grow and i still work 20 hour days to this day i do it for fun nowadays yeah. like I, I really enjoy what i do and yeah I, just, oh, I don't like it i don't do it so beautiful man a bit of hunger in the belly is what i love to hear right so, so you're not going to rest on your laurels and go well made it. it's like got you this far and what got you here probably won't get you to the next stage in your in your life journey as well right i've made it compared to the old version of me. Mm, version yeah. 2.0. The version 2.0, 3.0, you just yeah. need to keep upgrading that version. So, oh, yeah. well done. Hey, Matt, I want, to, I want to talk you through your journey. So uh, I know I, I said before I grew up in the suburbs. I know you're a suburb boy as well. Um, yeah. Not a product of your environment, but I guess, yeah, evolving, adapting, and now maturing as a, as a human for you and building a property portfolio Take us on that journey. You said you bought your first property in 2003, for example, and now your portfolio sits at, what is it, over 230 properties? Um, That's just residential properties. I don't even talk about my motels. It's like, I didn't, yeah. I didn't even think I gave you the background of the motels. No, no, no. But over 30 motels and pubs I bought, I built a motel brand in the last two years as well. Wow. Which is, um, 
yeah. So it all um it all just started from a, a hope and a dream of you know wanting to get ahead in life. And um, at the age of thirteen, I saw my brother buy a property. I've got three older brothers, um, yeah. not from a family of wealth or anything like that. Um, it actually, I kind of fell into it. I don't talk about this too often out there, but um, I had a brother that kept moving house every three months. He'd be in, <laughs> he'd be like a troublesome tenant, right? <laughs> um, he kept going from house to house, and my other brother got annoyed with having him move all the time. So he said, "Look, I'm going to buy a house. You live in it, and you take the rent out of the wage because we had a family business." And he goes, "Okay." And um, when he bought the first property, um, I was like, "I want to buy a property." And it was 1998. I was 13 years old, and I didn't know anything about it. And then I thought about it. And I thought, "How much would I need to earn to buy a property?" Right? And all these sort of things were questions that I had. And at the time, going back in like late 90s, early 2000s, an average wage was like. 30 grand, yeah. uh, it was 40 grand, 50 grand, 60K. And um, that'd be like an 80, 90K a year mm. income now. I thought, if I want to buy a property, it's going to be tough. I'm going to have to pay for it myself. If I wanted to build a portfolio, how could I make the property work for me? So as for you know building a portfolio, I thought to myself, if I just had 10 properties that bring me only $100 per week positive cash flow, I'd be able to get 1,000 bucks a week, 1,000 bucks a week, 52 grand a year, mm. I'll be set. I'd never seen anyone do it. I hadn't seen there was no podcast, yeah. there was no Facebook, Instagram. There wasn't even realestate.com. Okay. Right? There was no internet. Um, and uh, yeah, with it, I remember uploading something onto the trading post way back in the day. I was like <laughs> I was 15, right? And they asked you, what's your email address? And I remember my brother at his work, one of my brothers, he had an email address for work. And I was like, I just typed in his email address and work and he got into shit because I posted <laughs> that on the trading post, right? That's how long ago it was. And um, yeah, I just had a simple strategy of getting 10 properties and I thought it was impossible. But I thought mm. if I just worked two jobs, I was happy to sacrifice the years between 18 and 30, which was 12 years, to work hard, do whatever it takes to get to 10 properties. And I thought if I could buy one property a year, screw up for two years out of 10 years, something good's going to come from that. And um, like when I was 16, my dad died of a heart attack, uh, age of 62. He didn't get to retire. And I thought to myself, like, he kind of got ripped off. And mm. I didn't want to have to go and work 40 years of my life, 50 years of my life, and not get to enjoy it. So that's why I thought if I could just, you know, sacrifice a bit of my youth, mm. I can have those chances to do what I want. And um, I started with buying properties uh, in Western Sydney. Uh, Mount Drill was my first property in uh, 2003. It was 248 grand. Uh, I don't own the property anymore. I sold it for like, Five, just under shy of 500 grand, like probably eight years ago, nine years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, that property is probably worth about 900 grand today. And um, I don't regret it, but I've never heard anyone come back to me over the last 15 years in business either saying, Hey, Nathan, I'm so happy I sold a property in the past. So property is a long term strategy, yeah. but I sold it specifically to buy my first dream house. And um, that's, that's why I sold it for just because I had no emotional attachment to it. It was just a financial uh, instrument. And um, so I bought the first one, uh, rented it out, bought the second one, the third one, worked real hard, saved the deposit. I had no understanding about how finance worked. Mm. Uh, I had no understanding about certain things. I just thought work hard, do what I need to do to overcome the hurdles. And um, yeah, I got to about seven, I got stuck. And I realized at that point, I went to a broker and the broker gave me a bit of a nudge and said, hey, you can buy this property. It was a little townhouse. And uh, I bought the townhouse and I wanted to buy another one in the complex. And I thought only houses were good. But then I bought this townhouse, not really wanting to buy the townhouse. And I was like, damn, it's not the property game. It's actually the finance game. Yeah. Because without the money, you can't do shit. Yeah. Sorry for swearing. But, no, that's yeah. a, this is real talk. Colorful language. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I I realized at that point that it was a, a banker's game and I needed to fit in and work out. It wasn't what I wanted as a property. It's what the bank needed to give Correct. me more money, more money and spare my base. And I realized that I realized very young that inflation was important and uh, time brings inflation. Mm. Debt becomes relevant with inflation and the owning assets that get inflated away, it's not just the capital value of the asset gets inflated away, but it's also the cash flow that's attached to that that gets inflated away as well. And um, I was at a point when I was uh, 24, I quit my job. I had about 18 properties at the time, wow. uh, 25 properties at 25, and uh, I just keep adding to it. And now, you know, I'm just 
playing a bigger game with motels and you know like a game of monopoly yeah, yeah. A, a real life game of monopoly is what it is <laughs> i've never played monopoly right but it's, uh... <laughs> you'd be the ultimate monopoly shark but mate congrats and um yes yeah, scaling up i mean i mentioned before what are the, what are the, what are the stats less than one percent of investors get past six properties I mean, you said you got to seven, you hit a wall, right? It's amazing you probably got there and then hit a wall, right? Because most get two or three and then they hit that, hit that ceiling. To, to break through barriers, now mentally it says, I don't think you've put mental barriers here because you said, look, I'd, the sky's yeah. the limit. Um, yeah. But you and I probably come across individuals where they, maybe we are guilty of thinking small sometimes, not thinking big enough. How did you yeah. go from there to go, hey, look, 230 is not an unreasonable number, for example, and or you know, now moving into motels, like that's a, a what I'm trying to get here is that's a real psyche difference. Yeah. So for me, I've never actually sat there and said, "Hey, I'm going to get 230 properties." So my goal now is to be a billionaire by the age of 40. I'm 37. Nice. Um, so I'm getting there, but yeah, still a little bit off. But I, mm. it's, it's, if I keep my hustle up <laughs> strong enough, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. Um, but I never set out to go, "Okay, I'm going to buy 200 properties." If you tracked down the 18 year old version of my myself and told me that i was going to be where i am today yeah i'll tell you you're a liar i'll tell you that it's impossible etc um but i just did what i needed to do and uh, like i got this saying I, I don't know where i picked it up from but it's uh new levels bring new devils right mm. so every time you try and get out of the new level there's a gatekeeper there to try and hold you back well said right? and it's just looking at how to break through that yeah, it's always looking at how to um, push forward and get out of that, that that next level. So I get told no all the time, right? Oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. But then I look at it and go, okay, well, what do I need to do to make that happen? Mm. And um, especially when it comes to like my investors today and with finance and stuff like that, people say, oh, you can't borrow anymore. It's like, well, why can't I borrow? So there's questions that, you know, you shouldn't be getting asked from your clients as well. Like they should be asking you. Like people fail to think. To ask those questions right people go well i was told i can't borrow i can't do anything right yeah. but if someone's asking you well why can't i borrow well you're failing servicing well how far am i failing servicing right because then it gives you an opportunity and somewhere to work with with going okay i can then earn more income or i can remove something that's less important from my position that's holding me back and yeah. i'm constantly looking at what can i refine in my position and i treat my property investing like a business i've treated like a business yes. from day one yeah. Yeah. And that's Perfect. the goal. You see a balance sheet, you see the performance in terms of any business, like we'd be doing the same thing on, on our respective businesses going, what are the assets, debt levels, how do I move the, how do I move the needle in this business and what have you got to kind of move around to then get an uptick in performance, whether that's you're chasing a lift in the business valuation or lifting profits, for example, or cash flow. And again, it's very similar to building a property portfolio or an empire in your, in your situation. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. There's always something to do. A lot of people, I've found over the years, a lot of people don't think about pushing themselves. They just go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm dealt with this situation and that's mm. all I can deal with. But it's not, yeah. Yeah, excellent. One thing that I'm really, I, I think this has probably come from now having my own children, for example, and it's intergenerational wealth through property. And what you're saying here is you grew up in, uh, with all due respect, like a working class family. Yeah. Right? And now you've moved yeah, yourself yeah. almost to billionaire status within one generation yeah. like that is that is shifting an entire class in this beautiful society right so intergenerational wealth through property has enabled you to then live this life where you've got a wonderful home uh, and a fantastic portfolio as well how important do you feel that's been in your journey in, in terms of i won't say yeah. legacy but in terms of the way that you've shifted your entire wealth position as well i'd never actually thought about it until you just said it uh, yeah, right. until you just said it to me then right like yeah. i never really sit there and think about it but when you say it it's like it has been it's 20 years right if, mm. if i can do it why can't anyone else do it right yeah. it's having strategies having plans it's having the ability to to make those moves and i think a lot of people get bogged down by that but um for me i started off by just looking after myself right by wanting to build portfolio like 10 properties is enough to retire me and just be happy right yeah i don't need 200 but then it's like okay let's get the 20 let's get the 30 let's get the 50 it becomes a, a game and um i feel like at each level there's been a level of like letting things go as well right i have to recreate myself as a new mm. person if you look at a, a baby you said you've got children as a baby grows they learn different things every three months they're changing you can literally yeah. see the changes by a week passes um 
as a kid gets to about 12 years old, they stop growing. Mm. But as a human, you should be keep looking to reach new levels and growing and adapting and change the environment that you're around. Um, I know today I'm not playing for myself, hey, like I should be relaxing, I should be on the boat, I should be, <laughs> you know, I don't have a boat, right? But I should be having a boat, I should be doing all those things. But I'm playing for the next generation, the generation after that, the generation mm. after that. And um, I actually thought about something the other day um, about intergenerational, like people don't know their great grandparents. Yes, right? great. They don't know their great grandparents or their great great grandparents. So there becomes a point, which I think might be in the next few years for me, which is like, okay, well, there's going to be five generations in the track. They're not even know, going to know I existed beforehand, yeah. right? So um, it, it's where does the, the intergenerational, you know, stop? Because I can just keep playing this game forever. But there's a game there to play. And I know that for me now, I'm not playing for myself. I'm playing for mm. my kids and their kids and their kids. And that's probably, you know, where I'm yeah. at. And it is cool. It is knowing. It is good knowing that you know it was created from nothing anything can be created mm. and um yeah it's big become a game well done no, well done um i want to move to a different type of topic kind of going and i feel like these are softer areas like the hard area the hard technical side on here's how to like build a portfolio i feel that's a softer more um unspoken skills that we need to kind of get from yourself as well and one is yeah. the resilience around being an investor so it's from 2003 you can easily call that yeah. a few turning points probably in your journey. So 2008, GFC, um, yeah. all the changes that happened 2014, 15, for example, boom, and then you know, contraction with APRO, you know, intro, APRO interest only. Then the recent boom, for example, now we're going to come in maybe a different type of lending environment as well. So navigating these different ebbs and flows, how have you handled, obviously taking that in your stride, but what, I guess, how do you then impart that type of resilience to, to newer or less experienced investors as well? Yeah. So... At every point, right? If I went back twenty years and I hopped in Marty with, went with the crazy doctor and the DeLorean and go back twenty years ago, right? Um, I'd be thinking to myself, like the same things that I hear today mm. would be the same things from twenty years ago. Um, people were saying house prices are too unaffordable, right? Because mm. they've gone from two hundred grand to four hundred grand in Sydney. Um, they said the interest rates were too high because they went to nine <laughs> percent, right? Um, they said that, oh, it's too risky. They could change negative gearing, right? All of these things that we're hearing today have all been said over the last decades, right? And it's funny because I've actually collect data and I, I've got a photographic memory, so I'll just remember things. Mm. It's probably like a little secret weapon of mine because I look at it for data and it's like the things that people are here today have always been around is, you know, what do you listen to and who do you listen to and how mm. do you take that advice and what weighting do you put on that guidance? Um a lot of people will tell you, you know, you shouldn't be investing or they're fearful of debt and they'll give you it from a place of love and care and all that. But I, I remember I was like 18 or 19 and I had like three properties, four properties. And I had a girlfriend and her mum said, Nathan, why do you keep buying these crappy rental properties in Western Sydney? Why don't you sell them all and buy one nice place out in the Northern Beaches? And mm. I was like, because it just doesn't work, right? In my head, I was like, it doesn't work. And I thought about it. I tried to pull it apart as much as I could, right, and try and reason with it. She was giving me her view as, you know, a non-investor, as someone that, you know, is fearful, and their financial position wasn't, you know, the greatest and all that. And she was giving me based on fear. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. If I prognosticate and look at, uh, uh, you know, how this will look like in the future, my portfolio was based on the fact that, I've worked on the numbers. I've, I've built out a business plan. I've worked out how many properties I need at what sort of price ranges, what sort of growth, what sort of rental returns and all that to get to my goal. I had a roadmap to work towards and I had clarity on what I needed to do in order to get to where I want to be. So I looked at it. I was like, hang on a second. Yeah, that's important that that person said that, but doesn't fit into my schedule. It doesn't mm. work. Your opinion doesn't you know, pay the bills here. So I don't want to listen to it. So always sort of, take everybody's feedback on. Mm. Uh, one of my best mates is my accountant and he's the most conservative guy ever, right? And he doesn't, doesn't have any sound debt, like a normal right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think he lives vicariously through me, right? Because <laughs> he might not be fun, but he's, you know, his risk is very different. Yeah. And he always tells me not to do stuff, right? And then I listen to him and he tells me the reasoning and then I go do it anyway, right? 
but I've taken on his fear from risk and I've added it in and tried to make sure I'm ticking the boxes to minimize that risk mm-hmm. and the fears that are genuine issues. And when I do it, I'll pull it off. He's always like, you're my hero, bro. Right? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's, um, but it's, it's, it's achieving that. And um, I think that there's a lot of negativity out there. There's lots of reasons why you shouldn't invest. There's lots of things why you shouldn't do. But I guess from me starting from nothing, I didn't have the fear. I had nothing to lose. What I had to lose was 40 years of my life working a job that I hated to have a mediocre lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I had nothing that I was going to lose for start. Nowadays, I always think, like, if I take this action, is this going to blow my legs off, right? And that's, you know, very, very important. Yeah. Now, well said. Uh, I guess another part behind the whole resili- resilience uh, element is headwinds. Uh, I'll call it out. Um, like media, for example, like I was, a number of years ago, I saw an interview with Koshi and yourself and um, yeah, you almost, I felt like you almost got hijacked. I'm not going to revisit open uh, past wounds, but it's like, I thought, wow, oh, no, we sh- no. shouldn't we be celebrating someone that's kind of had some gusto and built a portfolio? It's like all the fear was like, what about this and what about this? So I was like, oh, that's a very interesting perspective. And it's almost what you said there is someone's projecting their own fear or their own opinions or ideas. Rather yeah. than celebrating it, it's almost like fearful of what could go right. wrong as opposed to what could go right. There was actually a lot of respect from my side not to be silly on TV when Koshi said that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of his colleagues were my investors that I'd helped out over the years. And uh, Koshi comes from the, oh, I'm the, the smartest man. guy in the world. <laughs> but I'm the man, right? I'm, yeah. the big, I'm the big man on campus, right? And then to have like a 25-year-old back then to come in and say, oh, I've got hundreds of properties yeah. and you know other people that I had – I think that there was a bit of like an ego clash with the media personality, right? And right. it's like, I think that this guy is an expert at what he does, but mm. I really question a lot of his things, right? I question his investor. I, I don't know the bloke, so I can't mm. really comment too much on his position. I don't know anything about his investing to even know if it's good or bad, but I hear what is said in the media. Yeah, um, I've been on TV for over 100 times and uh, I've had lots of things to say with lots of content in it, with lots of value to be had. Yeah. And um, I realized from being in the media so much that that is, you've literally got a, a puppet to go and tell you what you can and not say on mm. TV. If you speak outside of those parameters, then it, it gets shut down. Right? Yeah. And um, it, it's just interesting. I know when there's lies on TV, I know when there's a lot of you know BS in TV and in the media, and it makes me question everything else that's out there when it mm. comes to media because I know what I know and I know that lots of things don't add up that I see in the yeah. media, especially when it comes around the financial markets. Mate, well said. Uh, it's, uh, I feel like that's a very mature response from where you were at 25 to where you are now. It's like yeah. I'm running my own race and I feel like that's yeah. that's a very strong message to be putting out there to your community and to your tribe is to go, hey, run your own race and don't really worry about, I guess, what mainstream media is trying to put out there because of faith of it, it's, an, it's an eyeball game for them as well. If we look at some fun facts in the media in the last year, they said, Interest rates will not raise until 2024. Oh, right? 100% agree with that. Yes. So if we look at interest rates now, they were 10 basis points beforehand. Now they're 235 <laughs> basis points. So in perspective, the cash rate was 10. Now it's 235. That's gone up 2,350% mm. in six months. The media lied to everyone. Right? Yeah. They also said in February 2019, that interest rates would not go down and the next move would be up. At the same time, I'd calculated the amount of liquidity in the system and certain things that were going on. I said they'd have to move down and the time that they would. On the 4th of June, 2019, the interest rates came down. And it's like, these guys are saying stuff based on what's their agenda, who's feeding them, who's paying them, who's their hand that's behind mm. the TV. And that's really important. Yeah, so, yeah. that was said great angle. So I guess your uh, your philosophy to investing, it sounds like you've maybe sold or looked at your portfolio. So out of 230, there's got to be high achievers like any, I'd almost say 230 team members, high achievers, yeah. high performers, stars, and then you probably got some middle pack and you probably got some um, need yeah. improvement <laughs> parts exactly. of your portfolio as well. So how do you then kind of judge uh, at a point where you go, hey, look, I might sell or I might keep that, for example, like how are you how are you yeah. assessing your portfolio performance? Yeah, cool. So I think there's a couple of areas and aspects that look at from that. Um, when 
I buy an asset. I'm just looking at the picture of owning it forever is what yeah, I okay. buy. It. So I'm not a big fan of selling it. Yeah. Um, but definitely over the years, there has been some that have gone crazy yeah. and there's you know some that haven't done so well. Um, I buy properties that are below market value. So when I'm buying them, I want to make sure that you know there's a buffer in place. So if everything's selling for 300 and I pick it up for 200, I know that if the market goes down or whatever, there's a, a protection there. And there's also instant equity so I can redeploy it into the next deal. Um, when I look at um, the properties that I've offloaded over the years, yep. uh, there's been two reasons why I normally offload them. One is it's achieved its purpose. I only bought it with the sole purpose of flip it, flipping it on. Yeah. Uh, well, it could be three. Um, second one is that it's just got heaps of fat in it. And I just think that the market's too hot. And, you know, I think it's, it's done a really great thing and I can move on with it. Um, or the third one is just more of an admin. It just becomes annoying from an admin perspective, like, you know, can't get a tenant, something like that. And out of, you know, I would have bought at least 300 properties for myself. Actually, I would have been more than that because I haven't calculated any of the motels. So maybe 350, 350 properties that I bought for myself. And out of them, I've probably sold 10% if I was lucky. That were just because I just go, oh, well, you know, I can... I just couldn't be bothered with it, right? Mm. And sometimes I look at my portfolio and go, one or two go, one or two go. And this year actually has been one of those years for me. Um, and I know they'll look back in a lot of instances and say, hey, you know, I shouldn't have sold that thing, but yeah. I also got to look at the opportunity cost. Yeah. So, um, so I just I actually got one that I sold that's settling today. Uh, oh. That's a, a sales for right? a new settlement, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't sold any property for the last four years. Yeah. Um, I've got six properties that are being sold right now. Um, and the reason being is I've, I've got about 25 million worth of motels that are settling over the next three months or so. And I really, with those motels, I'm running the businesses of them. I've got the real estate, like one of them's got like a hundred rooms in it. So I'm just like, well, if one little unit here or one little house there, it, it doesn't really change the perspective but that's mm. the options that i've got because i created that portfolio so um yeah i don't have any real strategy around selling them yeah but around buying them there's a the buying is very important yeah you look at the long picture yeah perfect i want to kind of go back to one point so you said that like, you dated a girl and her mum said look why don't you yeah sell and then buy maybe like a northern beach a like good area for example so yeah. it's the notion of do you buy more and have 230 or could you have 50 yeah. in the Northern Beaches, for example, or something? How do you? How would you advise that uh, if a client's got that, that type of uh, crossroads mindset. Yeah, mindset? Okay. Um, once again, we'll go back to the funding of it, right? Yeah. So if I look at the funding of it, I would have only been able to buy that one property because it would have drawn all my servicing. Yes. So I wouldn't have been able to buy the 50. Yeah. Okay. So I wouldn't have got to 50 in the first place. So um, the way I look at it is if the market was to double tomorrow, would I want to have um, a million dollars that doubles to 2 million or would I want to have 5 million that doubles to 10 million or 10 million that doubles to 20 million? The larger the asset base, the larger you know the result will be in the end. Um, I haven't seen, well, if we look at Sydney, for example, uh, and look at, I don't know, Vaucluse. I've bought properties in Vaucluse. Yeah. The, I, I a unit over there, I bought a block of six units that was 600 grand a piece. They're worth about two mil a piece now. So yeah. that's gone up from six, 600 to two mil. Um, I've got um, houses in Mount Druitt that I bought for 120 grand that are now worth like 800,000, right? Yeah. So the same growth, probably a greater percentage of growth that's happened in those smaller little properties. But the thing is, is that with that Bull Clues property, it was renting for like 500 bucks a week. It's renting for like 850, 900 bucks a week now. Um, the rent hasn't been there to support the income that's required to get the financing. Mm. So that, that that wouldn't have been allowing. Where if I could have bought for the same money, I could have bought five properties that rent for 300 bucks a week. That's 1500 bucks a week, which will allow, which you've got five tenants going up by 100 bucks a week. Yeah. Rent each, you got more hooks in the ocean. So, yeah, okay. um, I've always sort of tried to look at it with a level head of, okay, if I make this action, what are the different outcomes that would happen from here? Will it help me service? Will it help me get capital? Will it help me, you know, how will it help me five, 10 years down the track? And if I do take that option now, how will it hold me back from being able to take other actions which could be 
more beneficial today. Yeah, so. okay. Yeah, interesting perspective. Thanks very much. And you, I mean, you mentioned when you're quoting some sell price, some of the purchase prices that you bought in the past, people are just going, scratching their head going, there's no way you could buy properties in yeah, Mount Druid or anywhere parts of Sydney from what you what you can what you yeah. bought it for then. So I guess when you're looking at some investors coming in, entry level yeah. can often equate to maybe cheap properties. And I guess there's 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 yeah. a real distinction between the two. You either buy a cheap property or entry level. Like how did how does that distinction work in your eyes? Cheap is just cheap, right? Mm. You can have a cheap wallet. You can have a I remember this guy that worked for me once, actually. He tried to copy my business, actually. It was a funny story. Yeah. I'm not going to give him any life of, sure. of energy, right? For that. But um, this guy worked for me and he pulled out. Like, I had a Louis Vuitton wallet. I'm not a person of brand. Yeah. I don't even have, like, like, no name on my shirt. Like, just, yeah. yeah, try and keep it clean. But I had a mate of mine buy me a Louis Vuitton wallet once and uh, I was wearing it. And this guy tried to copy everything that I was doing, right? It was like really scary when you think about it, right? <laughs> trying to copy how I talk, trying to copy my story, trying yeah. to copy everything. And he went to the Parkley Markets and bought a Louis Vuitton wallet that looked the same. Yeah. Right? I don't have the wallet on me. I, it's probably my car or something. Yeah. But uh, he had this wallet that looked identical to mine. But within a month, my own was like three years old. It's probably like seven years old now. It works fine, right? Yeah. No scratches. Like it sits in the car door and everything like that. This guy's wallet, after a week or two weeks, started to fray. Yeah. All the edges were broken, right? That wallet looked like my wallet. It could have been deemed as cheap, but it wasn't of value because it didn't last, right? So people look at cheap and think, okay, that's good, good buy. But you want to look at value, not a but, not cheap. Yeah, there's a big difference in a yeah. value and cheap. So when I'm buying an asset, it doesn't matter where it is or what it is, right? I'm always trying to compare it to recent sales and other properties currently on the market. So you can only see from other properties that have sold what is available, what is selling, what is the market like, and I like to look at historical episodes in those markets. So whether it be two years, five years, ten years, twenty years. I love when I buy a property and I'm seeing it cheaper than what it sold for 20 years ago because I'm like, something caused the market to go up, the market crashed, where is that market now and what is the story, what made that occur? So it's analyzing that data. So um, I look in Sydney and we see that Sydney, like here we are in 2022 at the time of recording this, and you know, if I said to you that you could buy a unit in Sydney for 265000 people would say, you're a liar, you can't mm -hmm. buy in Sydney. And I'm not even talking Mount Druid, I'm talking like good areas, right? You can still buy properties in Sydney for 265000 The market has gone up and doubled in the last two years, but there's still some pockets which have been left behind. Those areas are generally unit markets in Sydney, but they're areas where migrants used to come, but there hasn't yeah. been migration there, so it's been a, a soft sort of market. And you can sort of prognosticate and go, okay, this market used to be worth 400 grand and now it's 250K. All we need to do is wait for idiots to come and pay 400 again for it. We've already almost doubled our money by doing nothing, right? Collect the rent, it's positive cash flow in the meanwhile, and uh, it's low risk. So, yeah, that's what I look at is in, in each individual market. I don't want to look for stuff that's, you know, I see people go, oh, look, here's a cheap property. It's $200,000 and it's a retirement villa yeah. or it's a strip accommodation or it's some other sort of property. And it's like those properties have got massive, massive risk attached to them because you can't finance them. There's you got one out of a thousand people that would actually want to buy Spot that on. property. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, that's the crappy wallet. Scenario, yeah. I mean, really, it's a good analogy. Uh, I think that's that's one thing that we always come across is people trying to buy, real distinction, cheap properties, and like you're saying, that they're either ni cheap or niched properties that make it very hard to either on sell or get the uplift. And then it's that yeah. distinction between okay, you buy maybe a growth corridor or under market value, and that is a, a very clear distinction that you made there. So thank you very much. That's right. It doesn't matter if it's in Vaucluse or whether it's in Mount Druid or whether it's in. I don't know, Tamworth, for example, there will be good buys in any market. It doesn't matter if it's in 2003, 2010, 2020, mm. 2030. There will always be an opportunity. It's a matter of finding that, that opportunity that fits in line with your goals, in line with your strategy to help you to get to where you want to be. Uh, thanks very much. And I guess the, the other question I'm going to preempt that I get from a lot of our listeners is when you get to talking about 230 properties, probably involve ourselves, which is in financing. So how does the, you talk about game of financing, for example, to really stretch yourself there, how have you had to break through barriers when it comes to financing as well, Nathan? 
massive, massive yeah. issue. It's always been an issue of the bank. So um, for me today, I use like commercial facilities. I actually haven't had a loan for about five years. And yeah. I just started getting some loans now, which will help with the next level of, you know, I was sitting at a, a table the other day um, with some people and they're like, oh, you know, we buy mortgage-backed securities and stuff like that. Like they're, I'm dealing with the bank's banks is yeah. where I see, I think I have to bypass the bank and go to their you know, facilitator in the future because I want to get to billionaire status. No bank facility. You got someone at the back end earning fifty k, typing in your serviceability. Go, this guy doesn't exist. <laughs> I'll be spending two weeks there. Well, the so, credit managers, uh, uh, in fact, they'll probably just put that into too hard basket and go, mate. I can't even assess this exactly. damn deal. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important to have a path of clear resistance. So actually, um, I've used one broker over the years. Wow. Uh, maybe two or three other people that have done a loan here or a loan there. I used two banks, three banks, three banks that I went to like directly and then one broker and then maybe three other sort of lenders that have got a one off. Um, and it's important. Like I remember going to the bank once and I had 25 properties at this point and I was 25 years old. And I remember going to the bank and I just thought it was normal to have an Excel spreadsheet. Right? <laughs> And I had an Excel spreadsheet with the address, the purchase price, the purchase date, the current rent, um, the current loan, the interest rate, the weekly repayments, and everything broken yeah. down from a cash flow profit and loss. Because that was like something I could just look at and go, cool, yep, there's my position. Yeah. If interest rates change, you just adjust a little bit. If you want to forecast, you can put another tab and work out what mm. it could look like. And um, I remember going to the bank and this guy, I was trying to get a loan for a $40,000 purchase, <laughs> $32,000 loan, right? <laughs> um, I just sold the place for like 250 k I was like, shit, I've held it for 10 years, but wow. it's done all right. It's yeah, yeah. like 10 months or whatever. But he goes to me, he goes, I've heard of negative gearing, but I've never heard of positive gearing. I've never seen anyone come to me with wow. 25 properties. It was like a challenge, right? It was a challenge for him. And um, he liked the fact that I had it all put it in a spreadsheet and even at that point when he did the loans there was 25 um like rental statements that he needed to provide him 25 loan statements mm. so all this information you would be pushed into the hard the too hard basket by just going to a normal broker or a normal bank because yeah. there's too many moving parts like as a broker or a bank they're like they'd rather take someone that has two adults earning income no debt 200 grand deposit, million dollar loan, easy, yeah. walk out, I'll get you a vanilla loan, go to whatever bank. But they don't want to go, this guy's got loans at 50 grand, 80 grand, he's trying to get a loan for 50 grand from me. You know, it's a mess. So I have it clear and concise so I can show it to whoever that I've been dealing with over the years. And I've given them a plan as to what my goals are. I can tell them any numbers because I've got them all there in transparency and then back that up with whatever relevant docs that the bank would need. But, um, it's always been about wondering what the bank needs from me. So it's not when I buy a property, people I think get fixated too much on the property, but not yeah. what the property is going to do and the destination. And the destination is what's very, very important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I mean, thank you very much. I really, I really, really appreciate your your generosity, not only sharing your portfolio because it's, I mean, it's quite personal, but you've been very open about it. So thanks for your transparency, but also. Just so you've been able to pay this forward with knowledge and insights and wisdom, uh, I really genuinely hope that this helps some investors kind of lift up, play a bigger game and probably shoot for the stars rather than just going for the the easy path as well, which I think is a tendency that a lot of people can and myself even take some time as well. I was talking to one of my clients the other day and he's had 18 properties and it was like, it was he's done over like I don't know, four years or so. And he was like kind of stressed. He's like, oh, I want to get double my portfolio, right? I'm like, dude, you've got 18 properties. We'll get you to 20 by Christmas, right? Yeah. Just get there, right? This guy's only on like 120 grand a year or something like that. Nothing crazy, right? Yeah. Um, I was talking to him and halfway through, I was like, this isn't a strategy session we have. This is like a this is like a counseling session we're having, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, fuck, you know, like leveling my game. And it's the second time I've heard that in a week, right? Like this guy was saying, I need to up my game. I need to, you know, change the goalposts and mm. the, the mindset. And um, I think one other thing as well, like once you've got the portfolio, you've got five properties, you've got 10 properties, you've got 20 properties. This is a game, right? This is a system that we're built into. We go to a 12-year indoctrination camp of school. We get told how to live our lives, be a good citizen, yeah. pay taxes and all that. Um, 
is not to get out and get ahead and break free. I was saying at the start, like the new devils at new levels, um, the system is designed to keep us obedient and a servitude to the system, right? They don't want people having lots and lots of properties, lots and lots of options, right? Mm-hmm. And what I've found is no matter what problem I have, I always have problems, right? I always have adversity. The problems that I have, the same as what everyone else has. You might add an extra zero, so my problems might be a lot bigger than yeah. what the normal person problem would be. But whenever I have a problem, I've got lots of options. The property is purely just an option. It's an asset. It's a vehicle. Um, that property that I'm selling today, I bought it for two hundred uh, for three hundred grand. It was in the Sunshine Coast. The reason why I sold it, I needed some cash, and I was just sitting there going, "Okay, what's got a few million to each one?" I was like, "This thing here, I bought it for three hundred. It's worth like one point two. I owe yeah, like two hundred on it. Give a million bucks." People say, "I don't want to buy a unit, right?" I know so many people, it was a bulk deal, this deal, actually. I bought it back in 2012. So, so many of my clients are like, oh, I'm scared. It's a unit. It's modern. It's in a big complex. Well, I don't care. It's so cheap. I'm making money just by signing the contract on it. And I'm selling that thing today, and I'm going to put a million bucks in the pocket, right? A million bucks. I've got a, a, a building which is 100 units in a complex, right? The land bay is on one acre in a CBD center. It's 100 units in a block that settles in like a month. And uh, I bought that for two point nine million dollars. Gee whiz! So, literally, that little unit that I bought for three hundred grand, I've got no problem shooting it in the head, getting rid of it, taking the million dollars because I don't believe that it's going to be worth one point two million dollars ten years later down the track. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's journey, and it can help me get onto another path without taking the the, the decisions. The decisions that I make today are based on the decisions that I made 20 years ago and the choices that I had. We all have choices. We all have options that we're dealt with. We get 24 hours a day. We can be fearful. We can be you know, too greedy. We can be too scared. There's lots of emotions that can hold us back or hurt us. Um, and yeah, I think that you know, the options that I have today are based on those decisions that were made many, many years ago. There's no instant like confetti fall from the sky and go, great, you've, you know, you've, you've made it or anything like that. It's, it's just a gradual progression to have more choices and options and freedom to do what you want. Mate, really, really good sage advice, mate. Thank you very much. Hard to believe you're under 40 with that type of advice, but mate, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate that, mate. Thanks for having me on. Not at all, Nathan. Thanks so much. What we're going to do is include details for Be Invested. So if you want to reach out to Nathan and his team and find out how they've, you know, how they can help grow your portfolio or maybe just want to troubleshoot and break through a few barriers, whether it's mental, whether it's financial, uh, let's chat, whether it's ourselves or Nathan. Um, we just want to surround clients with good team members and great advice to go with it, mate. So Nathan Birch, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Aaron. Easy. That's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. If you've found that helpful, leave us a review. And if you've got questions, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to answer them for another episode. That's a wrap. We'll see you next time.